Good morning, Josh. Well, April. Hey, Abby. Hello, friend. Can you hear me? No, hold on. Let me check my sound here. Oh, that's why. <laughs> okay, here we go. Howdy, everybody. I was just looking at. Uh, hmm. <laughs> Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Ah, there we go. Okay. Um. Let me paste the link in for the minutes. What time is it in uh, in uh, NZ right now? Um, it is currently eight a.m. tomorrow. Oh, it's not that bad. Not bad. This is a, this is a great meeting. Yeah. The um, yeah. Well, mostly um, April and I are both West Coast, and when we realized we didn't have anybody on the initial list of members who was in Europe. We were like, let's hold this one in the afternoon. Nice. The, um, so I pasted in the um, minute stock there in case some people don't have it handy. Um, so uh, I first, um, let's get the formalities out of the way. Um, welcome to the governance working group meeting uh, for June 22nd. Um, this is an official uh, working group of the CNCF, and therefore we are subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. Um, this meeting is also being recorded, um, so don't say anything that um, you wouldn't want your mother-in-law, the cloud native hacker, to read about. Um, the um, uh, and then uh, we can get started. Um, We've got a few things on the agenda, um, but not a huge workload. So if you have something else, please add it. Um, and we appear to have just lost April, so hopefully she will rejoin. Hello, Paris. Um, so first things here, um, most of our activity for the last week has been around the maintainer diversity requirement, as it's called, um, for graduated projects. Um, so this is a requirement uh, for graduated projects that is in the CNCF graduation document. Um, but it's there as kind of a bare sentence that just says, uh, the project must have committers from more than one company. Um, now, this requirement has given projects, various projects, some problems, um, partly because a lot of its terms are not all that well defined. And so um, we've taken it on as kind of the first requirement to try to give a full workup to. Um, so, oh, let me add the link to the documentation. Um, and if you actually look at the documentation draft, um, that has an example of the kind of workup that I'm thinking of for dealing with these requirements for SIG contributor strategy in the governance working group, right? Which is the idea is to give projects a full framework for understanding the requirement and how to fulfill it. Um, and part of that has involved going to the TOC and saying, okay, this is your requirement. What do you actually mean by this? What is it you're actually looking for? Because I mean, the truth is we're not actually looking for two committers from different companies. It's more that committers from multiple companies shows us certain other things about the project. You know, it shows us that um, it's a demonstration the project is open to um, contributions regardless of employer, um, or it's a really good indicator of that. Um, I, you know, and that 
governance is not wedded to corporate hierarchy and also gives us some idea of what would happen to the project if something happened to that particular company. Um, it's also honestly a good sign for adoption as well, mm. right? Because if some company that was late to the project liked it enough to put somebody on to working on it full time or half time, then clearly that means a lot to them. Um, but the TOC answered the primary requirement was that they're looking to demonstrate that the project is open to contributions regardless of employer. Um, and while there are other ways that that could be true, um, I, having maintainers that don't work for the same employer is the most material demonstration of that idea. Is the name? I guess, would it be better to call it a multi-employer requirement or a multi-group requirement? Yeah, if you look at the draft criterion, I'm suggesting rephrasing it, oh, cool. which is to say, control and maintenance of the project and its code must be shared among more than one organization. Sounds good to me. Because <laughs> to be blunt, one of the things we ran into is not all projects use the word maintainer the same. Yep. And we ran into one project where they call every single contributor a maintainer. Um, and we don't want to tell the project what kind of nomenclature they have to use, right? We just want to say, look, we don't care what you call them. We just want project leaders that don't all work for the same person. The um, now, one of the things that this is also suggested and has come up in a discussion with the Linkerd project is that um, backing this rationale, we might be, you know, we might be suggesting that it's possible to make a case for a project to demonstrate their openness to contributions in other ways. It's just that it would be much harder to do it in other ways, right? If you've got maintainers for multiple companies, then we don't really need to look at anything else. But if um, you don't, then we need to look at, okay, how many real contributions came in from outside your company? How were they approved? What's the published approval process? All these other things to demonstrate that you're still open. Um, the, um, that has not been approved by the TOC at this point. That's a suggestion that I made. Um, the, um, Mostly because I think, because we have a lot of projects that are borderline where like, yeah, they have one or two people listed as maintainers who don't work for the same company, but they're not really active, you know, or other things like that. And, um, and if we look at the intent of the rule, then we can maybe work with projects to fill it in other ways. One of the things that's been within the Kubernetes community that I've been wondering if there's ways to make available to other CNCF projects is our um, ladder uh, uh, for creating the owner's files and those YAML files themselves being a really clear indicator beyond commit um, uh, people who have authority uh, to, um, to be you know, suggested automatically as reviewers and, and to be those who have the um, authority to approve and that's a, it, I don't know, I don't, we don't want to push governance on folks, but the accessibility to that infrastructure isn't exactly easy at the moment because the Kubernetes community has its own uh, infra, Kate's infra working group. Um, not to, to side rail too much, but we're, I, I'm working with some folks on uh, possibly something like a CNCF infra working group um, because of the conformance work we're doing so that some of our tooling can be there. Um, yeah. But I'll drop that as just as a side note on another possible metric. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a good idea. I mean, so part of our job as a working group is going to be to write up a bunch of advice to projects for, hey, here's how you do these things. And I think writing up the owner's file structure and you know how this is a good way to sort of distribute ownership of code mm -hmm. instead of saying, hey, we're gonna have this one owner's file in the root of our main repo and that's gonna control everything. Um, 
I think that's a great idea. I would love to own that and take any okay. suggestion from either of you on people to talk to who uh, can speak authoritatively that if I were to like interview or chat with them. Uh, okay. And, yeah, that's super important to me in a, in a way that um, I think is good advice, not just to CNCF communities, but other, other communities as well. I like the inclusion in genders. Should I, how do we capture that? Just create it. Um, I'm adding it to the notes right now. Beautiful, thank you. The, um, yeah. You know, and obviously not, not everybody's gonna solve it that way, but it's one way to solve it, right? Because then you can just compile it and you can say, hey, I have this list of people who don't work for the main sponsoring company who own these bits of code. You yeah. know, the- um, I like that um, you're phrasing it as suggestions and advice, not as, um, yeah. as the way. Mm. Yep. Um, Cool. Anything else on? Yeah. So, um, in terms of future from this, I'm going to continue working with the TOC to um, refine the maintainer diversity requirement. There's currently rather a long discussion happening on the issue. So, um, Although I think it's worth noting that the one person posting the most on that uh, thread is not on the current TOC, not on any current SIGs, and not actually the leader of any current CNCF projects. So um, just just for a sense of perspective, uh, that's, that's Alexis. He was on the first TOC that we had, um, but he's not currently. So, um, the, um, mm. yeah, yeah, and it is, it is problematic to use the term diversity when we're only talking about, um, diversity of employer. I, it, it's also been, it also, uh, <laughs> smacks me in the nose every time we discuss it with the fact that, the CNCF has no official other diversity requirements. Here, here. Um, the, um, um, which is one of those things that I think we're going to sneak in via advice. Um, as in, we can write a bunch of advice about improving contributor diversity in, in terms of much more than employer. Um, but um, getting the CNCF to adopt those is gonna be a real challenge. Um, the, um, which we should eventually. Yeah. I I understand there's a lot of different folks involved. Uh, what what do you think the challenges would be in that regard, and how can we help? Them? Um, honestly, that so many projects are so so far from being like really anywhere with that. Like I would say, aside from Kubernetes, most of the CNCF projects, um. The standard CNCF project has one or two Chinese or Indian contributors. Um, no women contributing, nobody from any other non-white group. Um, impossible for me to evaluate, obviously, gender presentation, sexual orientation or disability, um, just based off of people's names. But with the projects that I've been working with, Let's just say if we were going across the board with CNCF projects and doing general diversity scorecards, um, most of the projects would be getting a D minus. Mm. So um, 
taking it on is going to mean a major CNCF-wide effort, um, which means I don't want to throw it in casually with a list of other things. I'm also not certain that it is, would be under governance working group. I think this would be more contributor growth or general contrib strat. Yeah, I, we, I, we plan on working some, on something. Yeah. The, um, I mean, one of the things that's recently come up is that the diversity picture, aside from employer diversity, for the CNCF SIGs is pretty dismal. Uh, something that I noticed, by the way, mm -hmm. um, it seems like the groups with the most um, maintainer um, variety with vendors and organizations are the ones that have either community managers or community groups because those are two intentional spaces where that growth can happen and it's not a afterthought and i think that is the difference i almost wonder if we should put a graduation requirement that you have someone taking care of you and not just a someone, but people. And I think that's the difference. I really do. I think it's the who's nurturing, who's responsible for this, who owns this. And it's not just a like, oh, look at all these people who own different parts of the code base. It's mm -hmm. who actually owns the operation of these things who's going to like, you know, and in a lot of their cases, what you're seeing too, like even with Nats, like maybe they should form a steering committee. It's like right. there needs to be some kind of like body and or people assigned. Okay. And that is something that we would actually approach through governance requirements for that matter, because one of the other parts we'll get down to in a later item is that there's a requirement that the project have governance. Yep. But materially, all that's in there is that it has to have a governance.wd file, and that file must have words in it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I think the requirement should be much more robust. And I think the idea of saying, hey, to reach the graduated level, a project must have meta management, right? Must have something beyond just code management, um, whether that's a professional community organizer, a steering committee, or whatever, we we could totally put that in the um, in the you know this is what graduated governance looks like. I mean, we might get pushback on that, but it won't happen if we don't ask for it. I'm keen. And governance does go, we're talking about governing humans in, in a way that allows us to collaborate on something that is the, the shared output of those humans and to not have some humans whose sole focus is the humans and the health and the connection and the collaboration of that. Um, it seems as a, as, a, as a large missing piece to the puzzle in the way that we govern ourselves. I am definitely on board with putting a proposal forth to the TOC. The graduation requirements include humans focused on humans. Preach. 
I actually like that line. I'm not going to lie to you, Hippie. Um, yeah. Because it's just like succinct and like you know what it's talking about. You know what I mean? Because I was sitting here like staring at the wall thinking of something clever, but I was like, that's it. <laughs> I like to call things what they are with extremely accurate names. Yeah, I like that. Well, that was why I said my core definition of governance is the definition of who does what and gets what and how. The, um, and, um, yeah. Okay. Um, that sounds good. Anything more about um, the um, poorly named maintainer diversity or um, multi-organizational leadership, which would be a better name for it? Um, Loving the name change. Yeah. Uh, we want to try to ensure that we capture this, this need for the governance structure change. Yeah. You know, is, is either an AI or a thing. And I, I, I do want to be a part of that in way that I, that I can offer my time. Okay. Okay. Uh, we will a little bit further down the agenda for today. Cool. Um, one of the other things I wanted to say is, so um, uh, one of the other things that's kind of fallen um, into our lap is the end user requirement. <laughs> now this isn't, honestly, strictly speaking, a governance requirement. Um, but it's ended up in governance working group because there is no other clear place to put it right now. Um, and it is a project requirement and partly was because April actually cares a lot about it for GRPC. Um, the, um, so um, the, um, so it's ended up with us and I don't mind it being with us. At some point I could imagine it being shifted over to a different working group or a different SIG. Um, but in the meantime, where we're looking at, hey, we need a lot of clarity around these requirements. It's, it's easy for me to come to the TOC with a laundry list of saying, hey, here's the requirements that projects are not understanding. Because um, for the end user requirement, the big discussion was does the TOC care more about demonstrating adoption of the project outside of its initial vendor and partner ecosystem? Um, or are they caring more about building up the end user council? Because those two things can have a different definition of who is an end user. You follow me? The end user council is specifically companies that are not in any way cloud vendors. Whereas if you take a more general definition of end user, a company that is a cloud vendor in one context can be an end user of another product that they don't work on at all. Um, so, um, and this has been a material question for several projects that are currently um, trying to get into incubation where they have a bunch of adoption, but it's among companies that are cloud vendors in some way, even if they don't contribute to the project. Um, so um, the, um, and that includes cloud native build packs and um, cloud events actually. Um, so, so we're looking at, you know, what's the definition of this for, what does this really mean in terms of these projects getting accepted and, and then coming up with again, a, a structure for the SIGs who are evaluating projects and saying, you know, hey, do they actually meet this requirement or not? To be, to ask for some clarity, Josh, on the end user requirements as they stand, does it require defining that or does it require having a list? Uh, from the project, it requires having a list. Gotcha. Um, Basically, I mean, this is one of the, 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 
the reason for this that the current TOC chose is what I call um, avoiding CORBA. Did, did you ever do C++? I know, I know CORBA from many different languages, C++. Yeah, know. so if you remember the object management group used to get together twice a year and every meeting they would define 50 different standards for code structures that were never used by anyone. Um, and no one wants to repeat that. Um, so the, um, and, and that's what the TOC chose as the primary reason for this requirement, um, which from my perspective is good because it gives projects a fair amount of flexibility in terms of building up their end user list. Yeah. Are we trying to get clarity on an updated reason for the TOC to have this list? Or They've already given us clarity. That's the update I'm giving oh. for the agenda. That's gotcha. And so now I'm working on a draft that will be, so part of my vision for the requirements that they currently have, right? So currently for the requirements, they have a long document called requirements. In each document, it has this really short section that lists out the requirements for each level. A lot of these requirements are very short sentences that are really not explained. And so my vision for that, for at least the ones that overlap governance in some way is, um, and you know, I would like to see the same thing with contributor growth, right? Is that for each of those requirements, we then have a, it links to a document and that document explains at much greater length what the requirement actually means. Along with advice on how the project can fulfill the requirement, you know, as in, hey, you have to have end users. Here's a bunch of advice on how you make contact with your end users and how you get them to go on the record as being end users. Because um, that currently does not exist within the CNCF. The, um, so, Um, yeah, I mean, the end user one is not nearly as troublesome as the diversity one for whatever reason. I think it's I, maybe because it's not as hard. I wonder in the past <clears throat> when dealing with, uh, particularly for conformance, that's the area I come into it, um, uh, people, the reason for that being <clears throat> Um, less about adoption and user council and more about the where they come in on the the um, the joining scale or whatever like or, or, or within the, the the how to buy a ticket <laughs> to the show so to speak and I just want to put that up as an acknowledgement of a pattern I've seen as far as people self-selecting uh, you know are they an end user or, or, or not? And sometimes pushing back on that, depending on some more subtle things. I think this will provide some clarity around that. I appreciate it. Okay. The, um, mind you, Cheryl was not in that conversation. So I still want to sync up with her on it because she may have a very different opinion on whether or not um, the end user council and user committee what is the end user group called? I know it's EUC, but I don't remember what the C stands for. Um, committee, I uh, think. Yeah. Community, community. No, it's community. Community, community. Yes. How, how strong of a, because um, I mean, the thing is we still do want projects to help recruit end users, their end users for the end user community. So it's mm -hmm. not like we're dismissing that. The question is whether or not them having done so should be a requirement or, um, a request. The um, okay. Um, so, given that, um, 
I started writing out an outline and I haven't gone beyond the Google Doc stage in this because I haven't been able to sync up with April on it um, or, or anyone else, um, partly because of a lot of other things going on, um, the, um, uh, which is to say, okay, the main product of this working group is going to be honestly a bunch of documents. Um, uh, well, documents and interactive advice. We've we're already started on the interactive advice um, because, you know, having announced contributor strategy projects are coming to us and some of them have um, governance problems and the, they end up here. Um, the, um, um, but we also need to produce a whole bunch of documents. And so I was trying to construct sort of an outline of the documents we're, we need to produce. What is our checklist of documents we need to produce, right? And I see this falling into two areas with interlinking between them. You know, one is backing documentation that's related to governance requirements. You know, what the CNCF expects projects to do in terms of governance requirements. Um, I mean, as an example for that, we say, hey, to get into the sandbox, a project has to adopt the CNCF code of conduct and um, the CNCF's IP policy. We don't supply anywhere any helpful information for how a project materially does this. Um, the, um, and so that's, you know, sort of what's needed in document. Like, hey, here's how, here's some suggested steps on how you would adopt these, you know, here's what these requirements mean. And here's some suggested steps on how you would do these things. Um, one of the things that doesn't really exist at all now that the TOC is interested in and I would like to produce is basically construct these sort of two tiers of required governance. So this is how much governance we expect an incubating project to have and what they materially need to have to fulfill that level of governance. And this is how much governance we expect a graduated project to have and this is what they need. You know, Here's the checklist of things that they need to fulfill that requirement. The, um, and that could include things like, you know, on the graduated level, things like, hey, you must have a person or people or a council that is responsible for looking after the humans in your project and not just code. Um, And then the second half of this would be a body of just sort of general advice of for projects developing governance. Um, so, um, you know, like, um, and this particular set of advisory documents is got a really large overlap with contributor growth to the point where I think we're just going to, it's going to be a lot easier to work on the same documents and co-edit them. Because like, you know, I say from a governance perspective, you have to have a document outlining who is a contributor, but that who is a contributor document also needs to have a bunch of contributor growth stuff in it as well. Not just, you know, a definition of here's the requirements for being a contributor. Um, um, you know, and then examples of different governance structures that a project may have and how to actually implement them. Um, and, you know, other things like, hey, how do I recruit diverse leadership for my project? Um, the, um, a couple of things I'm not real sure about in here um, are, uh, release process, whether or not we feel like that falls under this or not. I mean, because I, it's not currently a CNCF TOC requirement or that sort of thing, but I kind of feel like a mature project needs to have a documented release process. Um, among other things, my personal experience has been with projects that do not have a documented release process, the release process becomes a place for bad actors to subvert the project. Um, 
um, or for well-meaning contributors to get completely stonewalled. Um, the, um, but I'm not sure about that. I'm also not sure about where, I kind of think SIG security needs to be in charge of any security issue handling, et cetera, that um, projects have. Um, there actually is a requirement in right now about security for graduated projects, um, meeting the whatever it is best practices guide, which is another Linux Foundation thing. And there are things in there about security issue handling and that sort of thing. But again, we're not providing project with any advice on how to create that. So that's kind of, that's what I had started out with the outline. I could really, really use some feedback and additions and stuff to this outline before I turned it into a checklist on an issue um, and say, okay, let's hammer these out. To make sure I'm tying things together correctly, uh, mm -hmm. Josh, um, I'm going through the bullet points that existed when, when I started adding notes and um, mm -hmm. the update agenda on maintainer requirements, diversity and doc draft, and then I started adding things under update end user requirements. But I'm unsure if that was part of the work outline for work your documentation link further. Or no, work, work outline is the next item, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, where is this update on end user requirements? document that you're referring to then? Or is this ah, okay. Um, hold on. I think that is just an issue. There is no document at this point. So let me link the issue. There we go. Thank you. Yeah, and I'm going to move this all down under the other agenda item. So take a look at that outline and see if you have any thoughts on where we should go for it. I mean, not necessarily now, but. Yeah. Okay. I noticed that uh, our friend, uh, is it April? Yes. Yeah. And I wanted to make sure that if she wanted to be a part she knows we're still here. I don't, I don't know. There was a drop. Yeah. I don't know what her candle is, but if we wanted to make sure she I was included. Yeah, I pinged her on, on uh, Slack. Yeah. I don't know what's going on. No stress. The, um, yeah. Because she said she was going to be at this meeting. She was at the beginning, and then she disappeared. Yeah. So. Um, being sure the invitation is clear. I told her, I had texted her and said that I scared her off. And um, she said she's having an issue with Zoom. It's a Zoom. Ah. Okay. Or a computer thing or something. Um, anything. Good. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, one of the other things that I wanted to just bring up for this committee, though we're not necessarily going to do a lot about it initially, is that currently one of the things that the CN, that the SIGs and the TOC consult is this CNCF health chart, which is a bunch of stats based off of a dev stats model that Lucas put together for the CNCF. Very pretty. It's very pretty, but it is very hard to get any of those stats to correspond to any kind of reality. 
because like I've been working directly with a couple of projects that, for example, are having trouble with the maintainer diversity requirement. And yet, if you look at it in the CNCF stats, like one of them shows, you know, that the founding company is only responsible for 55% of, you know, contributions. But then if you go in GitHub and you look at any of the individual repositories in that project, and you look at the last 200, you know, commits, 195 of them are from employees of that company. So there's something about how those stats are being collected. Um, that is resulting in, in some potentially misleading numbers. Um, so um, I've brought that up with Lucas. He's swamped with some, he's been swamped with something else from the last week. Um, but I'll be investigating exactly, you know, that. Um, that aside, one of the other things that um, Chris A has requested from us is that at some point, contributor strategy as a whole, you know, so looking at the various areas, um, I go over that health chart and basically suggest um, what we really should be looking at. Because honestly, that chart was put together on the basis of you know, here's two dozen statistics that we can easily obtain. Yeah. Um, rather than, hey, here's the 20 things that matter most when evaluating the maturity of a project. Um, Prioritizing the visibility of those questions and the making sure that the answers we're seeing are accurate reflections of reality would be a nice. Yeah. I would say in the way that we're looking for a cadence from our projects, it would be great to get um, for the uh, for the release cycle. It might be good to get a, a health update rather than and it's something that's curated by a human that goes through and checks on the health. Uh, of these things in a meaningful way, and maybe because we only have this many things, like it wouldn't. I don't know. This is a thought because this is we're talking about the health of these, and the same way we're talking about the you know the graduation criteria, including humans uh, caring for the humans in that area. It would, might be good for a human to check in on the health of those communities as a whole and give a report on these are things we've noticed that you would never notice unless you cared to talk to them. Yeah. Um, currently, by the way, that is something that CNCF committees and staff are supposed to be doing um, for projects is there's supposed to be this annual review process. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not clear on how much that happens in reality. It would be cool to see it like AF, ASF style, like what we're trying to embed in Kubernetes itself, you know, from an annual report perspective. Um, Garris, I'm not familiar with the ASF model in the regard you're speaking to. Can you? Oh, so um, Apache Software Foundation has an annual reporting structure for their projects um, <clears throat> where their PMCs, which is like their chairs in Kubernetes, except for they can actually flip the bits um and they have to report in on project health quote quote and apache software foundation determined it's like a list of x number of questions that helps them determine like what project health looks like for their projects and then they like host them online and do like a big deal about it um so like if you wanted to go see like what tom Katz's annual report from last year was you could go and see it like how many number of contributors they have kind of like a, a curated dev stats i guess almost but not necessarily like dev stats or like a report but um and that really forces those communities too to talk about project health, which is something that we really wanted to do when steering on the Kubernetes side, which is while they're completing these reports, they're gonna have to talk to their communities about them, right? So that like gives that forcing function of, oh, let's talk about these things today. And, you know, not necessarily not, so. Wondering if we could help out there. 
from our group. I'm trying to think of how, or especially programmatically anyway. Probably, and, and actually, honestly, looking at the annual review is more of a participatory exercise where the project participates in helping prepare it, I think would help make them actually get done. Mm -hmm. Because currently it's kind of up to say SIG committee members and the CNCF staff, um, all of whom are kind of overloaded considering the number of projects that are out there. I really like where you're going, Josh, with providing advice and suggestions. I wonder if we could take it a step further with offering uh, times to help get those things across the line with people who can mentor in those areas that we're requiring. Um, and I know that's the CNCF's overall role, but I wonder if there's not a way to make those uh, help, you know, the uh, being able to raise the hand and say, I need it and, and, and having that connection time available is similar to and, and maybe modeling that in our other community as well with you know our one-on-one um, -on -one, uh, mentoring hours or, or find some way where mentoring is, is a heavier part of uh, modeling the, the behavior we want to see by defining it really well um, in, in suggested areas without it being a requirement of them. Um, more of an invitation to do it with all of the help that they would want should they you say yes. I would like to do it in that way. Um, can you can you help me? As far as we're trying to find a way to concise this down into actionable <laughs> uh, roles and helping and mm -hmm. moving forward. Well, Paris already had a couple of things in her contributor strategy. One was sort of an office hours concept. Um, the um, with every other meeting, I think it was. Well, now it's just every meeting. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we because we were gonna try to like be like super coy and be like, oh, every other meeting and like, oh, this meeting will do these things and this meeting will do these things. And then we were like, whatever, everybody come. Yeah. If you need help, we'll figure it out. <laughs> um, so yeah, no, every, I want, I want, I would love for these meetings every Thursday, at least not necessarily this one yeah. this meta meeting, but like the, all the Thursday meetings for contributor strategy, we should make it, make the projects feel comfortable to come to us. Um, or if they need for us to come to them, we should also have that as a service. Cause like, I would also, I also think it's cool if we could go to some of our community meetings so that it like, it looks like we're bridging a gap and not necessarily, you know people have to come to the principal's office. Um, so like, I, that's what I've been telling some of the other projects too. Like, if you want us to come to you, we'll come. Like, we can schedule another meeting. We can be in the open. Yeah. And like, whatever you want us to do, we'll do it. I do actually kind of wonder if it would be useful, particularly after you've gotten... Um, Particularly after we have some kind of a way to reach maintainers to, to actually do something with a topic. Like to say, hey, we're going to have a meeting where we talk about, you know, how do you recruit maintainers from outside your company? You know, or, um, you know, how do you figure out who's going to enforce the COC? The um, uh, a recruiting playbook set as an issue for yeah. under our repo that I hope I, to eventually start on. Josh, I like your idea of having a, an upcoming thing of here's the next few topics. Because often we have so many things on our plate in community stuff that having a deliverable of a date for a smaller subset of things for that would result in direct benefit to the community on a rhythmic basis, um, I think would almost allow a continuous release valve of 
of good <laughs> without us constantly being under a wave. And it doesn't take all of us to do that thing. We can alternate out on who's, who's the release valve for innovation <laughs> or community you know, support by having some type of, uh, of topic list and people you know, picking up things important to them and, and inviting people to come hear about that. I, I don't know. It's, it's uh, something not quite congealed there in my head. Yeah. I mean, I was honestly also kind of picturing the maintainer circle. Um, um, contributing to this as being kind of a uh, self help with with us assisting. Hippie, you should help me with that. I think you should. I, I yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like la, 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 la. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I am. I, I am yours to assist on no. all of these things. Uh, if I can, if I can get one more active person with me, we can hoist this up. Right now, I've got 0.5 of myself, and that's it. So if if you can get if I can get 0.5 of you, we can have one, and yep. we can hoist this. Me, I am. Up. Yes. The problem is. Up. And I'm not blowing the scope of this meeting, but the problem really lies with the a lot of the value here was in person, um, mm. with like in person events and stuff like that. But obviously, we're going to make it work and things like that. So um, that to me was kind of like what took me from a one to a point five. <laughs> it was like, poof, poof. Mm. Um, so it's just kind of like, you know, my personal dreams. Um, but anyway, we can still make something work and make it wonderful. I don't want to make it another Zoom call, though. That's what I'm nervous of. Like, I wanted to make right. it so people feel camaraderie and like, and, you know, something meaningful, not necessarily. I want to make sure I hear you. And the contributor circle is something that we haven't been able to give our efforts to fully and part of that is due to kind of the punch in the gut yep. of not Me. being able to have that. Uh, yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm stepping with you into that and owning it as well. <laughs> so for, so for us, from our sake, we really like the first thing we need to put together is like zoom calls. And that, that to yeah. me is like, just, that's the gut kick where it's like, Oh, mm -hmm. right now I'm put, I'm curating a, a yet another zoom call, but yeah. Maybe it'll be different. So I'll take you off. I'll take it offline and we'll talk about it and I'll show you all the documentation that. that we have so far. I would love it. Thank you, Josh, for sharing the, the call with Paris on that topic. We'll run with that. I, uh, you know, it's all pretty closely interrelated. Um, like, you know, you don't get, and, <clears throat> Because one of the other things is that, you know, I want feedback from the maintainers on, like, I'm waiting for the survey to see what people say are their main problems before I say, hey, we're going to have an open office hours on this topic. Um, the, um, so, um, the, um, Okay. Um, yeah, because right now the mentoring we're doing is one-on-one -on -one mentoring, which, as we all know, doesn't scale. The um, although it's helpful when we're talking about mentoring projects, which means that the numbers we're dealing with are much smaller. But it is a little silly that I am currently working with two projects I know of on the exact same problems. Mm. And I'm like, you two should be on a call together <laughs> because you have exactly I, the same problem for the same reason. I, Josh, <laughs> you've caught that for the two projects that you're involved with. And I wonder if, if from the CNCF perspective, we can ask that question of what problems are you seeing in the last two to four weeks? Because, and then and it won't be, I think yeah. waiting for a yearly report's hard. Yeah. Um, but I think if someone's constantly you know, kind of having that heart to heart <laughs> with the, 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 with those community leaders mm -hmm. uh, and, and finding those pain points so that the topics in maintainer circle can kind of yeah. um, address some of those, because yeah. to be honest, 
the news during a particular week can totally influence the the where people's minds are uh, yeah. for that week, and it can't wait for stuff to show up in numbers. It's got to be eye to eye. Yep. So I'm glad that you're taking that time to do that. I guess what I'm trying to understand is how we can um, have those conversations about what it looks like at a CNCF level to ensure that that, that is not um, all on one person and that it's not something that's um, not put as a high enough importance. Yeah, and I don't know, at this point, CNCF is having staffing issues for the same reason that many other places are. So if I feel like crying right now, I'm just gonna let you know it. Oh, <laughs> this is hard. I don't know. I feel like, honestly, I'm still enjoying this, this is... because I kind of feel like, look, look at look at the big picture here, right? Which yeah. is that we get to create order out of chaos and help people in the process. Yeah, that's correct. Um, it's just that there's a lot of chaos, right? That we're mm -hmm. we're right now facing this giant vat of chaos um and and it's going to take a while to to yeah. put that to rights but i've also noticed you know time in kubernetes i've noticed how quickly something that you introduce as a you know as a practice to solve a problem becomes institutional like you know I haven't had to intervene in anything with the release team for six months. The, um, and now we're trying to export that to the CNCF in general to make it a system. Uh, quick question for you, Paris, um, uh, before you jump. Oh, no, never mind. The okay. question's already answered in the issue, so never mind. Okay, bye. Oh, um, I bye, also maybe. need to go. Yeah. Uh, it was wonderful to speak with you both. I will speak with you all soon. Okay, thanks so much for coming. Yep. Bye. Thank you for being you.